Uh, my name is Kelly Wemple. I'm an architect and serve as the chair of the Denver Landmark Preservation Commission. Um, and I'd also like to introduce Jen Capetto, who's the manager of Denver Landmark Preservation. Uh, we'd like to just welcome you this evening and thank you for taking the time to attend this meeting. Your, partic your participation is very important to us because design review and protecting our city's historic buildings is a collaborative process. It needs to be between residents, owners, architects, contractors, city staff, and commissioners. Everybody needs to be involved. So we're holding this meeting to discuss the process for that collaboration as we update the landmark design guidelines. Uh, first, we'd like to start with about a 20 minute presentation from landmark staff, and there will be some interactive questions during that time. And the remainder will just be set aside for Q&A. So with that, I'll pass it over to Jen. Sounds good, thanks Kelly. Um, so wanted to go over a few of the um, reminders about participating in the webinar today. Uh, it's a, a meeting webinar, um, but uh, for rules of engagement, um, we will call on participants who ask questions um, at the end of the presentation, but you're welcome to put the questions in the Q&A at the bottom of the screen if you're joining by uh, computer. You can also use the hand raise button at the bottom of your screen if you're joining by computer, or you can um, click star, uh, star nine if you are joining by phone to raise your hand. And we will call on you uh, at the end of the presentation to ask questions. Um, we do ask that uh, people keep their questions brief. Oops. <laughs> keep their questions brief, no more than two minutes per speaker. Um, and please be respectful of, the, of all opinions and avoid obscenities and hurtful language. Just a reminder, this, is, uh, this meeting is recorded. Uh, we are posting it on our website in a, a couple of days um, once we've downloaded it. And um, uh, just to, to let everyone know that we may not get to all of your questions this evening, um, but if we don't, we will follow up with questions, um, answers later on. So. Um, be patient. <laughs> uh, so we, while you guys have an opportunity to ask questions, we want to ask you questions too. So we will be using a product called Mentimeter. It's um, an online tool that, um, that allows us to ask questions. It's entirely anonymous and it, the answers show up live on the screen. So the, um, you'll need to visit www.menti.com. Um, and that's here on the screen. And um, you'll need a smartphone, a tablet, or a computer if you'd like to participate in those questions. You will type in the meeting code that's displayed on the top of the screen when there are, um, when we get to the first question, you'll see that code and it does not change throughout this presentation. You will see the questions displayed on your phone um, or on your tablet or, or computer. Um, you'll also see the slides as we go through them as well. Um, so you'll select or type in your responses and then they will show up on the screen. Again, it's all anonymous um, and uh, we're not tracking who's saying what. So we wanted to get a sense of who was participating in the meeting. Um, and when we asked those of you who registered to uh, let us know what neighborhood, historic district or individual landmark you were, lived in or are from, uh, we got a, quite a wide variety of people who registered. So thank you for doing so. About 65% of those who registered in advance indicated what um, neighborhood, historic district or individual landmark they were from. And um, we mapped those in green on, the, um, on this map in dark green. So you can see we have uh, people from all over the city, which is fantastic. Um, some areas that are underrepresented, but we will um, continue to do outreach to work on uh, getting their feedback as well. Um, and then we have some more questions for you to, to get to know you a little bit better. So I'm going to turn this over to Abby Crispin. She is a senior city planner with the Landmark team, and she's going to start us off with the first mentee question. Hello. So you can see there, go to www.menti.com and there's the code that you enter is at the top of the screen. Um, if you get kicked off at any point, that code will always appear at the top of all of the questions screens. Um, so to get us started, what is your connection to preservation in Denver? So we really want to know basically what brings you to the meeting tonight. And you can select more than one answer as some of you may you know, fit into more than one of these categories. Um, are you interested because you live in an older building? Are you an architect, a contractor um, involved with your r &O? live in a historic district or landmark? You're just interested to see what's going on? You're an advocate for historic preservation? Are something else that brings you here tonight? OK, 
give a little while for everyone to be able to get logged on and get those responses coming in. So it looks like we have quite a few that live in older buildings. Those are our leading one so far. Yep, so again, if anyone unclear on how to use it, just you can go to a web browser through any device you have that can be on your phone, that can be, you know, if you want to open a separate screen on your computer or through a tablet and just go to that website and put in the code that's at the top of the screen. Okay, so it looks like we have pretty good collection of responses. So a lot of you that live in older buildings, live in districts and landmarks, but we also have um, you know, interested advocates, some architects, some contractors, and some with uh, that are active with their RNOs. So thank you everyone for being here with us tonight. Okay, see no responses coming in there. Okay, so now we will go on to our next question. Uh, so, you know, our goal, you know, with the design guidelines is to preserve the character of our historic districts and landmarks. So to kick off, want to find out then why you think that historic landmarks and districts are important to Denver. Um, so this one is an open response, put in, you know, your words and phrases, what you think of, what's essential, you know, why do, we preserve our you know, landmarks and districts. A sense of place, preservation, culture, all great ones. Design precedents, preserving character, authenticity, telling a story, having a connection, unique, stability. Um, or future generations, livability. All really great ones. Tell diverse story, beautiful value, maintaining history, um, sustainability, another great one, keeping the past. Okay, so thank you. That's some great ones there. Okay, wait another minute as more are still coming in. Okay, so to keep on time, I'll go ahead and move on. So I'm gonna start tonight with just a little bit of what are design guidelines. Um, so what do the guidelines do? Design guidelines establish design principles and standards that guide all projects subject to landmark review. The goal of the guidelines is to promote and protect historic character. The guidelines apply to all work on the exterior. This includes window and door replacements, any new building penetrations, and site work. Uh, landmark does not review interior alterations or vegetation. The role of the guidelines is to establish a clear understanding of preservation requirements that can be shared by landmark staff, the commission, property owners, and design professionals, and provide consistent project reviews. So our next question, we wanna get a sense of how familiar are you with our current guidelines? So have you read them cover to cover? Do you reference them often? Have you maybe flipped through them once or twice to look up, you know, some particular bit of information? Are you unfamiliar with our guidelines and have not looked at them? Okay, I'm impressed by how many have actually read them cover to cover. <laughs> Very impressive. A lot have referenced them often and referenced them occasionally as well, which is great. Okay, so, so 
definitely the majority of you at least have some familiarity with our guidelines, which is great. So how did we come up with our current design guidelines? Our guidelines are based on the Secretary of the Interior Standards for Rehabilitation. These federal standards were developed by the National Park Service. The standards outline responsible methods and approaches for preservation projects, as well as treatments that should be avoided. They establish a national preservation philosophy that informs preservation work carried out by state and local governments. Our guidelines are also informed by national best practices. This will continue to be the case with our design guideline update. Um, and staff is also currently working on some comparative research to see how our current guidelines compare to a lot of other cities across the US. And we'll have some of that information to share with you in you know, subsequent meetings. But while our guidelines follow national standards and practices, they're also adapted to Denver reflecting local history, design, materials, and concerns. And while the Secretary of the Interior Standards establishes a preservation philosophy, Denver's guidelines provide detailed guidance and examples of what is appropriate and what isn't. So how do the guidelines work? The guidelines apply citywide to all historic districts and individual landmarks and all project reviews are based on the guidelines. The guidelines help to determine which projects can be reviewed administratively by staff and which projects need to go to the commission for review, since only projects that clearly meet the guidelines can be approved by staff. The commission reviews projects on a case-by-case -case basis and has a little bit more flexibility, considering the intent of the guidelines as well as the specific guidelines. Some districts also have their own guidelines that work in conjunction with the general guidelines. Uh, Country Club Gardens, Country Club, Civic Center Park, and Five Points are all shown here, um, individual guidelines. We also have specialized guidelines that were recently adopted for La Alma Lincoln Park, our newest historic district. These individual district guidelines have been developed to address unique district conditions, but the general guidelines still apply as well. And how do the Landmark Guidelines relate to other city project reviews? Landmark is the first step in the permitting process and our review works in conjunction with zoning and building codes and their departmental reviews. Uh, landmark, landmark requirements may be more restrictive than zoning, such as requiring that the height of new construction within a district be compatible with adjacent historic structures, even if zoning would allow a taller building. But Landmark can also offer some administrative adjustments to zoning in cases where zoning requirements would result in a building that does not fit the district character. Uh, Landmark can offer adjustments for bulk plane and height and setback. And now I am going to turn it over to my colleague, Brittany Bryant. Hi, good evening, everybody. So now that we understand what guidelines are, we're gonna talk about the history of Denver Landmark uh, Design Guidelines. Next slide. So originally, um, the design guidelines were found in the district's designating ordinances. Uh, these guidelines were very vague and didn't provide much guidance. They said uh, things like the commission will have purview over height, massing, and scale. Um, so this wasn't incredibly helpful uh, to the community or the commissioners. Uh, so in 1995, as we continue to add districts to Denver, um, we developed our first citywide design guidelines. These were based on the Secretary of Interior Standards for Re Rehabilitations, um, but the guidelines were limited to just landmark structures and residential structures. Uh, so therefore, the commission had to adopt many supplemental design guidelines to address things like contemporary design, lighting and sustainability. Uh, these documents were all black and white and had um, very few photographs or no photographs at all, like the contemporary design guidelines, which you can see on our screen here. Next slide. So our current uh, design guidelines um, were begun in the fall of 2020 to update the nearly 20 year old 1995 uh, design guidelines. 
And uh, they were done to address um, critical issues such as energy efficiency, signage, modern technology, and intended to provide better technology. Uh, they became effective on October 1st, 2014, and we did do minor updates to this document in January of 2016, um, but we haven't done any updates to the guidelines since that time. Next slide. So why are we doing this current update? Um, so the major reason why we're doing this current update is to address new technology, um, such as LP Smart Side, which you can see photographed here, different uh, roof tiles, um, address climate change and greater sustainability, and to provide some clarity in the design guidelines based on our uh, seven years of doing design review with the current guidelines. Uh, we also want to remove language that we don't have purview over and provide uh, flexibility to the design guidelines. Uh, we would also like to provide simplifications and clarity to the guidelines, such as stating outright that vinyl windows are not allowed. Um, so next slide. So this time around, um, we're not going to draft guidelines and then ask um, your opinion on those guidelines. We're really going to get your input first and then draft the guidelines. So if you were around for our last update, uh, the guideline document was basically already drafted and we just asked uh, which of those projects fit in with the guidelines. And we're not gonna do that this time around. It's really going to be based on community input. Next slide. Um, so we're intending to do this through a phased approach. Um, and these are all tentative topics for our phases. Uh, these topics were identified by staff um, as where we really needed to make updates. Um, phase one, we're intending to update solar panels, retaining walls, cladding materials, and make clarifications to landscaping, sheds, lighting, egress windows, and fencing. And we identified these topics based on community input and that we get often on these topics and how we need to provide greater clarity to these topics and also from the commission. Um, again, we have tentative phases, but really the design guideline document is intended to be a living document that goes through several updates um, and is not sat dormant for seven years without being updated. Um, so you can see our proposed phases there. Phase two will deal with ADUs and tandem houses and accessory structures. And then we'll provide clarifications to site work and signage. Uh, phase three is about window replacement and alterations and um, additions and the infill chapter will be reorganized. And then phase four is uh, regarding non-contributing buildings and then we'll do revisions to um, alterations to commercial and institutional buildings. But again, these are all tentative topics. We will cover all of these topics at one point, but if you have different ideas for us, we would love to hear from you. So next slide. So if uh, you have higher priorities. Um, if you could go to Minty now, and the code is 43012050, and tell us on a scale of one to 10 what your highest priority for the guideline update would be, that would be extremely helpful for us because we do wanna make sure that we're addressing um, what the community thinks is most important in the design guideline update. So we're getting in some responses now, and you can see um, that ranking scale there. It looks like in the lead right now is um, addition guidelines and making the guidelines easier to understand is a high community priority. So we'll just give it a few more seconds for people to input um, what they think is the highest priority for the guideline update um, as we have uh, 35 participants in Minty right now. 
And it looks like addition guidelines are still still leading followed closely with making the guidelines easier to understand. So thanks for everyone for participating in the Minty poll. Um, it looks like everyone is really interested in uh, addition guidelines. Um, so that is interesting input for us to consider as we had that proposed for a later phase. Um, but then also making the guidelines easier to understand is a very high priority. So that is also um, good for us to know. So we'll uh, move on to the next slide now. So um, in terms of the input we're seeking, we do want to know what's helpful about the current guidelines. We also want to know what topics or guidelines really need revisions and how we could make the guidelines more flexible and more user friendly. Um, but this is not an update to our ordinance and we can't change the overall mission of Denver Landmark Preservation. And all of the guidelines uh, still must meet the Secretary of Interior standards for rehabilitation. So keep that in mind when you are providing us input into the guidelines. And now I will turn it back over to Jen. Sounds good, thanks. Um, so we wanted to go over next steps um, and wanted to, uh, yep, move to the next one, great. Uh, wanted to provide some information about opportunities for engagement um, throughout this process, because as you see, it can see it's we're aiming to do it in four phases. Um, the first one is to sign up for a newsletter. If you're not already signed up, um, we encourage you to do so. All of those of you who registered in advance of this meeting that said you wanted to join um, the um, join the newsletter, I uh, we have that cataloged and we're going to add you to our list, um, but you can also go to our website and there's a way to sign up there. Um, we are going to have community meetings for each of these phases. And so uh, we encourage you to participate in the community meetings. We also would love it if you could take our online survey. So some of these questions um, are included in, with uh, many more questions in our online survey that is live on our website. So if you go to denvergov.org slash landmark, there's a, um, there's a page that, uh, that um, sorry, the landing page has a thing about the design guidelines and um, I'm gonna close this because it's beeping at me. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the design guideline update is on there and um, you can click on that and um, in the get involved there's a section on there for our, our survey we're going to have a survey for each phase of our project this the current survey just went live yesterday and it will be up for about a month we also um, the design guidelines are adopted by the landmark preservation commission and so we will have a discussion item for each phase of the design guidelines plus um, reviewing of public comments for our public drafts so you guys can provide comment there um, and then the LPC will have a public hearing to adopt the design guidelines for each phase, and there will be a, um, opportunities for public comment on that, either verbal or written. So um, many ways to engage. You're always welcome to also contact us um, and email feedback as well. So next slide, I think we've got a couple more Menti questions. So we tried to do as much as we could um, to do, to advertise this as best we could. Um, we have had a couple of issues with the landmark newsletter. We posted flyers all around town. Um, we emailed the RNOs. We had some targeted emails. We also uh, had some social media posts on Instagram and we are grateful for our preservation partners like Historic Denver who advertised it there as well and um, Chun. So just wanted to find out how you all learned about it so we can learn um, better from this process. And again, it's menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com, and you use the code 4302, sorry, 4301-2050. Great, so a lot of you got it through the Landmark newsletter or targeted email. Um, sounds like some word of mouth, which is great. Um, some more social media and RNO outreach, that's great. Okay, wonderful. Good for us to know. All right, and then our last question for you for the evening. Um, we are going to have our phase one meeting. Tonight's just the kickoff meeting, but then we, when we start phase one, which we plan to do, we hope in November, 
um, we want to know what is the best time because we had an internal debate. Do we do it on a weekday during the day, during the evening, on a week and morning? What's, what's preferred? So we're putting that out to you guys. It looks like far and away and <laughs> weekday evening is best. Uh, we're also going to have this as a virtual meeting just like tonight um, because we think that we'll be able to reach the, the broadest audience um, and also uh, due to the Delta variant being all in a room is probably not the best idea um, at the moment. So. All right, this is really helpful. Thank you. Thank you for this feedback. All right, so next we've got questions. We are gonna open it up to you all to questions. So you can either type those questions into the question and answer box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can click the hand raise function at the bottom of your Zoom screen or for the pe two people who have called in by phone, you can click um, press star nine and that will raise your hand virtually for us so that we can call on you. Um, just keep in mind that these, are, this, these questions are supposed to be about the design guideline update um, unfortunately, we can't really talk about specific projects that you might uh, have concerns about or questions about because we're um, in a public setting and it's harder for us to, to know what project that is and talk specifically about things. But you're always welcome to reach out to us by email or phone. So your, our email and phone are up here on the screen. Our website is also there. And then if you are on Instagram, you are welcome to follow us at Denver underscore Landmark. So first question. Becca? Hmm. Becca's talking, I can't hear her. Can you guys hear her? Nope. Nope, can't hear her. Okay, thanks. We've got a bunch of questions, so. I can read them are one if you want. Okay, that'd be great, thank you. Okay, this is, uh, given the city's acknowledgement of climate emergency and the steep emission reduction goals set by the Hancock administration, will solar be made uh, right by choice across the city? Will upgrades to energy efficiency for windows? Can you speak on how your department is working to meet those goals and removing roadblocks to energy efficiency and housing density? That is a great question. So um, the reason that we have solar panels on our phase one is because we've heard from the public and we've heard from commissioners and we've heard internally ourselves that we think that there could be more flexibility when it comes to solar panel installations. Right now, our guidelines say the rear two thirds of the roof um, or a non-visible accessory structure roof, um, or sorry, any accessory structure roof or entirely on a flat roof, as long as it's flat mounted. Um, but we think that there are greater opportunities for that. So that's that's a really important thing for us because preservation and sustainability and then um, climate goals really work hand in hand. There's always the, um, the explanation that the first or the, the greenest building is the one that's existing. And so we want to make sure that um, we are preserving those buildings and retaining the embodied energy there. When it comes to window replacement, um, there have been many studies that show that window replacement um, adds, adds um, energy efficiency for sure, but the um, overall cost and the, multi, the required replacement um, multiple times over the course of a building's lifetime when, uh, because many replacement windows can't be repaired, they must be replaced. So um, we wanna take that into consideration as well um, when we're looking at our window guidelines uh, there. Anything else you two would like to add? Nope. Okay. Um, looks like we don't have any hand raises. I have a couple of questions related to expanding property within the East 7th Avenue district. Um, there were photos attached, but we can't actually see those. Um, I've seen a few where houses have been torn down and new ones built to mimic the style of the neighborhood. Yet when enlarging a small house, the addition is to be subordinate and awkwardly placed to the rear of the structure. Why wouldn't the same rules apply to either case, given that properly done, a second story addition can easily be done to complement the original style? In talking to dozens of neighbors, they agree that they'd rather see something done that looks like original 1920s home. 
And then two, given that most houses in the district are already over an average of 2,300 square feet, perhaps the guidance guidelines need to be more flexible for small houses that do not meet needs or, or expectations, I'm guessing, is the, the end of that question. Okay, sure, I can handle that one. Uh, so when houses have been demolished within a district, it's because they're outside of the period of significance. Um, so when a district is designated, uh, generally that comes with a period of significance. So when you get yeah, something that's outside of that period of significance is based on our guidelines able to be demolished. I'm um, talking about then doing additions to small houses within the district. Um, so if that small house was outside the period of significance, there's probably going to be more flexibility for, you know, alternate. If that is a small house within the district that is within the period of significance, so it's considered a contributing building to the district, um, then that's considered a significant part of the district by itself. Um, and any alterations to that would, you know, have to, you know, meet our guidelines. And our guidelines are based on the standards. And so there's really three of the Secretary of the Interior standards here that would apply that would you know, work against being able to do a full second story addition. You know, so we allow um, second story additions, but they have to be at least 15 feet back and they have to be subordinate to the original. And that is based on you know, kind of guidance. So the Secretary of the Interior's um, standards say that new additions need to be differentiated from the old and need to be compatible with the massing size and scale and architectural features. That means new additions shouldn't, you know, exactly mimic. They need to be clear that they're an addition and they need to be subordinate to the original. Um, the Secretary of the Interior Standards also say that new additions um, should be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future, the essential form and integrity of the property would be unimpaired. So that's why we require that, you know, partly, again, that additions secondary additions be set back so that the front part of the property is kept intact. So, you know, that you're not completely altering the whole roof. That's why, you know, generally, you know, you need to minimize any second story addition so that as much as the original roof form and form of the property is retained. Then also getting to the question about, wouldn't it be better to, you know, have houses that are the same size that, look more like the other houses, the larger houses in the district. Um, that really speaks to standard number three, which says that each property shall be recognized as a physical record of its time and place, and that changes that create a false sense of historical development um, shall not be undertaken. So the district was historically a mix of larger houses with some smaller ones mixed in. And so it really would be creating a false sense of history um, to try, you know, give a, you know, just have all the properties look the same and it would be destroying an actual, you know, kind of the integrity or the design characteristics of a small house if you're just remaking it, you know, to kind of imitate the other houses on the block, but removing some of the, you know, original historic features. Um, so that's really, those are the Secretary of the Chair's kind of standards there that we're really basing that on. And we're already being a lot more flexible than a lot of other cities are. There's a lot of cities that would interpret those guidelines to mean that you can't do any second story additions at all. So we're really trying to work with the community. We know a lot of people want more flexibility there. And so this was our current guidelines was us really trying to find a happy medium between trying to still meet the you know basic intent of the standards and still trying to allow some design, you know, flexibility and more flexibility for expansion. Um, but to just totally pop the top and do a total second story um, would really not be in keeping with the standards. Great, thanks, Abby. Um, it looks like we're getting a few questions um, that I'll try to sum up into one theme here. Um, so. Will there be updates to district specific guidelines and thematic districts? And are we aware of other cities who have done recent guideline updates to borrow ideas from? Great question. So um, one of the things that we've been working on is, um, and our, our intern Taylor, who's with us tonight, has been working on quite a bit, is researching other cities' design guidelines to see what, um, to see what 
people are doing. So um, find out what how Denver fits in currently, and also if we can snag anything that would be uh, relevant or said very well in other cities' design guidelines. So uh, yes, we are doing our homework on that and um, hope to have that inform conversations in each phase of the project. Um, and then districts, is that it, the different districts? Uh, thematic districts. So I think this is probably relating to La Alma, Lincoln Park, or Five Points or something of that nature. Right. So we have two historic cultural districts. Um, as Brittany said, the Five Points and La Alma, Lincoln Park are our two historic cultural districts. And we have um, a set of guidelines for each of them or customized guidelines. We are planning to, um, it, you know, if there are other historic cultural districts that may warrant having their own customized design guidelines, um, for the existing other guidelines that are um, published, so Country Club and Country Club Gardens and Civic Center and um, a few others, and I'm completely blanking on what they are, but we are not planning to make a, um, alterations to those at this point. Um, right now, we want to make sure that we can try to reach the city more broadly. Um, our goal is to is because the design guidelines for Denver landmark structures and districts are the overarching design guidelines that are um, parent to those subsets of individual district guidelines. We want to make the overarching changes first, and um, and then potentially look at some of the other districts. I know Lodo has been a long time coming where that one needs an update, and um, still very much on our radar. Um, so there are some questions about the Secretary of Interior standards and why Denver needs to comply with the standards. Um, let's see. What is the importance of the standards? Is there an ability to create Denver specific um, that strive to main, maintain a sense of place without being so restrictive? I can address that some. Um, so partly it is that we are a certified local government and that is a program where through the federal government and then through the states and down to local governments, you know, kind of establishes a preservation network. And by becoming a certified local government, also called a CLG, we you know, are part of that national preservation framework. And we then are also able to access some preservation funding through that too. We can apply for grants and we can, you know, be part as a CLG that, you know, enables us to be able to review tax credits, to be involved kind of in more big picture discussions of preservation um, in the community and the state and policy. If we had standards or, you know, our guidelines did not meet the standards for preservation, uh, you know, the national standards and the Secretary of Interior established, we could risk losing our CLG status which would mean we couldn't do tax credit reviews, we you know, could, would lose access to funding. And it really also wouldn't be a very good look, I think for the city, if we had a program that was not in alignment with kind of you know, national standards for preservation. Um, so certainly we're looking for ideas that we can be more flexible, but we really feel like we need to stay um, within those national national framework for preservation. And you know, we want to be, you know, we'd love to create a set of guidelines here that, you know, we can be leaders in having both ways to be flexible, to meet conditions that we need for you know, climate and for, you know, diversity and equity and all of, but still working within the standards as well. Thanks, Abby. Um, it looks like there's a person with their hand raised. Brent, if you want to, Brent Carr, if you want to unmute yourself and ask your question. Sorry, accidental hand raise. So in the chat, there looks to be some questions about um, how far does our purview extend in terms of flexibility on secondary side elevations um, and uh, what we are proposing for those, um, for flexibility on those uh, uh, additional side elevations that aren't facing the front. 
of the house. Sure. Um, so we we do allow greater flexibility when something is not readily visible from the public right of way and that or from the public vantage points. So that would include um, any streets, sidewalks, parks, um, things like that, where there is quite a bit of public uh, visibility. We uh, review more strictly than we do uh, for properties that are portions of a building that are not visible or not readily visible from public vantage points. So um, we do not include the alley as a public vantage point because um, because alley that would so many of our buildings would be entirely visible. <laughs> um, so we we don't include them from uh, the public alley and we don't intend to to change that um, as a public vantage point definition. Um, but we do, we want to explore flexibility um, in terms of uh, alterations to those buildings, um, those portions of the facades that are not readily visible from the street. That's gonna be part of, let me just look at the, um, the phases that we had. Uh, you know, some of it could be the cladding materials um, in, indicated in phase one or egress windows that we're gonna clarify in phase one. Um, it probably would be something that would be part of the alterations to historic buildings that right now we're saying is in phase three. So we'll, we'll take a look to see what, um, based on your feedback from tonight's Mentimeter questions, but also from the, um, the survey that we're doing that's on the website. There's like also, sorry, another. there's also related questions to when it's a corner property and um, what the purview is there. Yeah, absolutely. So corner properties are visible from two or more public vantage points um, and they're readily visible. So we do, um, we, we are a little bit more restrictive there and a little less flexible than we would be if it were a, a narrow lot that's an, um, internal to the block. Um, there's also, we have historic districts where there are wide side yards um, and there's a lot of visibility on, on the side of the building as well. And there are other districts that, that buildings are quite tight up against each other. And so there's much less visibility on side elevations. And so we, we take that into account for sure in our design guidelines. Um, but if there are concerns about that, um, we, will, we will address those during the, um, the alterations portion of the, um, the design guideline update. It looks like there's a hand raised as well. Um, John Sullivan, do you want to um, unmute yourself? You'll have to do it um, yourself. Uh, I'm guessing he can't. There you go. You're, you can unmute yourself whenever you like to. Yeah, that was kind of a mistake. I guess I was just maybe at one point I was going to follow up, but while I've got you is, you know, there's a number of people I think that have more input perhaps that they like to provide than can be done in this format. And I think what you're doing is great, but is there a way for the people that are on board right now to get together and share their opinions and thoughts with one another so we can be more productive in getting back to you next time? A great question. Um... Because we're all, right now, we're all alien to one another. We don't know who's out there that may share some similar uh, ideas that we can share with you. Absolutely. Um, I think for privacy reasons, it's, it's hard for us to share um, the attendee list. Um, and also we don't, if you registered in advance, we have your, uh, your email address so we can send you um, information about the meeting. But uh, if you join the meeting after we had already started the Zoom meeting, then we don't have, have that information. Um, so yeah. I, I'm not really sure <laughs> how to answer that. Okay, am I still alive? Can you hear me? Yeah. So I, I say guess- one way, like one way you might do that is through your registered neighborhood organization. It'd be a great way to at least be able to get together with your neighbors and have your registered neighborhood organization, you know, give kind of joint feedback and brainstorm with your, you know, neighborhood in order of thinking about what kind of feedback you want to give us. Yeah, I think I'll do that. And I appreciate that. I, I, the irony for me is I bought the house before it was in a historic district and I waited 30 years to now want to add on to it. And, uh, 
you know, the street that I'm on, it was divided right down the middle of the street. One side of the streets in the historic district and the other isn't. So the rules were kind of um, convoluted to begin with. But I've always felt like a historic landmark needs to have a philosophy that, you know, we want to, we want to maintain the historic uh, integrity both with materials, size, and, and architectural design of the original neighborhood, and then kind of take it from there. But right now, it's so complicated. I mean, by the time you push back an addition on these houses, it looks like, well, what are you doing that for? You know, like I built a Denver Square a block away that's not in a historic district, and the neighbors love the house because it was a Denver Square that fit perfectly in the neighborhood. But you couldn't, you know, and, and to your point earlier, you know, that that one on 7th Avenue, you know, they tore down a 50s ranch and they built a, uh, a, a new colonial. And it's a beautiful house and it fits in the neighborhood perfectly. So if that's the philosophy with putting up a new structure, why should it not be the same philosophy with uh, increasing the size of an existing structure? You know, I've got an 1,100 square foot house and I've got to set this thing back 15 feet and kind of patch things on. It really, it, it, for, I'm also a real estate broker and I can tell you, I've talked to hundreds of people and everyone agrees that they would rather see a property that mimics the old style of the houses rather than trying to uh, band-aid sandwich them into some kind of guidelines that just don't work. So understood. Thank you for your feedback and, and your comments. We uh, right now we are planning to do the additions section of our design guideline update um, in phase three, but based on your comments tonight, all of your comments tonight through Mentimeter and through the um, the survey that we hope that people will take. Um, we, we will probably uh, push that up closer because it sounds like there's a lot of interest in that. So thank you. So there's a lot of questions in the chat about timeline and when we will kick off phases. Um, there's also some questions about additions in the chat. So that seems to be a popular theme. So I don't know if we want to go over the, our timeline. That we're yeah, thinking. absolutely. Oh, before yeah. we do that, I just want to mention um, to John's point about, you know, people being able, people who are attending these meetings to be able to talk to one another. I wonder if in any of the future meetings, maybe we could have breakout sessions. I don't know if that's planned or not, but that would allow for at least small groups to have conversations and report back. And maybe that would help with the efficiency that John was kind of getting at. Um, I know we can't share the attendee list from this evening, but maybe that's a way to improve the feedback in the future. Yeah, that's, ab that's absolutely what we're planning to do for the, the different phases. For the kickoff, it was just like, let's have a big meeting. And for each phase, the idea is that we would, um, we would have a meeting to talk about things that you might do um, you know, if, if we're an in-person meeting, we might have tables and people sit, go to rotate from station to station and talk about things together um, or individually. And that's that's our goal for the the community meetings that will be associated with, with each of the phases. And that ties into the next, the questions that had to do with timing. So we anticipate some of these um, phases are going to be short, some short, uh, you know, six to nine months. Um, some of them might be nine to 12, um, but what we're trying to do is to overlap them so that we, um, when we start having some of the public draft review for phase one, we will hopefully be starting phase two for the community meetings um, there. So just wanted to, we don't want this to be a linear path. We want this to have some overlap so that it's um, faster, but we also don't want you guys to get so um, fatigued by all of the meetings and all of the opportunities to um, provide written comment or verbal comment that um, it peters out because we really do value your feedback and your comments. Uh, if we could I have, have Mary. Uh, sorry, Jen, I have one more hand raised. Mary Chandler, if you want to unmute yourself, you may do so. Mary, you'll have to unmute yourself on your um, 
bottom of your screen. And I'm muted. Uh, Mary, you'll, you'll have to unmute yourself because um, we're not hearing you. I think if you click on your, your name and um, actually, I'm not sure what it looks like on that end, unfortunately. Okay, Jen, it looks like Mary's having trouble unmuting herself. I've asked her to unmute herself. So Mary, if you wouldn't mind typing your question in the Q&A section and we'll answer it. All right, we'll move on to, Brittany, are there other questions? I saw one question about the urban design lead. Um, I'm just gonna address that really quickly if I could. Um, there, we, uh, I don't have any news on that, um, on when that will be announced, who that will be. And yes, absolutely, we will be involved with, um, we, will, we will develop a relationship with that person and um, have uh, urban design input there by the, uh, the new city urban designer. We do have another hand raised, Jesse, if you want to move that person over. Yes, I can definitely move that person over. Um, if you would like to unmute yourself at this time. Shenzo Giacomo. Yep. Yeah, hi, this is Shenzo. Um, yeah, I, I did just type my question in. Are the guidelines that we're talking about only apply to the rated historic structures or all new development additions? Oh, great question. So um, it is so all of these guidelines are for buildings um, or structures that are in, within historic districts and individual landmark structures in Denver. Um, if they are, if it is a non contributing or non historic building that's in a historic district, it's there, we do have guidelines about that and it will apply. Um, but it's not. Um, there are different guidelines for new construction for non contributing buildings for additions. Um, and for the historic buildings. Okay, and are, are some of them, what's the, the nature of the, whether they're mandatory or not, just in general? Ah, got it, okay. Um, the, so the design guidelines are um, the overarching um, rules and regulations by which we do design review for any of the buildings in the historic districts or individual landmark structures. And um, if a, if an application doesn't meet the design guidelines, landmark staff can't approve it on our own. So it can't be an administrative review. We have to bring those to the Landmark Preservation Commission um, of which Kelly is the chair whom you've met. Um, and um, those, pro yeah, <laughs> those projects, um, the commission reviews and discusses whether um, there are unique circumstances to a, a property or a project that um, may allow greater flexibility and doesn't, um, it needs to meet the guidelines, but um, maybe there is, are some exceptions to be made based on certain specific conditions. I don't know if Kelly, okay. if you wanna elaborate on that at all. Yeah, I mean, the only thing I'd add to that is, is that uh, I think the specific conditions that Jen's referencing is, you know, there are many different types of buildings that fit within, at the purview of these guidelines, right? Uh, there's residential, there's commercial, there's um, you know all different types of districts, individual landmarks, and just contributing or non-contributing structures. So there's no way to have these be black and white for every property. So what the commission does is interpret these standards to a specific property, um, and you know as we discussed, a small home and a small lot may be different than a large home. You know, like these are all very different conditions. And so we discuss whether there are kind of unique circumstances to a particular site that would warrant or interpret the guidelines in a different way, if that helps. No, that was very helpful. Can I just ask another question and a comment with regard to that? Certainly. Okay. Um, I participate, I'm an architect in Arvada and I participated in the historic district guidelines uh, process about four years ago in, in uh, Old Town Arvada. And we worked really hard at, at, you know, trying to get them to be mandatory. They ended up being mandatory only on a small portion of the historic district, unfortunately. And um, so it was really voluntary for most of that. I'm one that believes it needs to be as mandatory, more mandatory as possible 
if that makes sense. But um, just furthermore, I just wanted to say one thing that was really that we ended up doing that what was mandatory was um, uh, uh, requiring that a minimum, a porch width, if you have a minimum width to it. And that's just when one of my pet peeves in uh, living in Telluride and the historic districts in the mountains and an amazing uh, example of, of a historic district is that the porches seem to be one of the most important things that, that connect people with the historic nature, the structure and the street and the pedestrian scale. Um, is there an ability this time around to do certain things like that, to actually get into the weeds on things like that that'll allow us to, to actually say, okay, in Arvada, we decided on seven feet, which I wanted nine, somebody else wanted six. We ended up with seven and I was extremely happy about that. But I'm um, sorry to go on about that, but I think it's really important in some of the things that personally, as a person that has a heritage and a, uh, my family grew up in North Denver, I'm just so disappointed that the, the building's without porches. So that, that's, I'm saying my piece and thank you. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's good to hear that everybody's got their pet peeves. We all do. And, um, and to kind of go back to your first point about whether they're mandatory or not, the guidelines are required if, you, if it's a property within a historic district or an individually designated landmark, you do have to go through this process in order to obtain a building permit. So if it's work that requires a building permit or zoning permit, then it requires this review. So it is mandatory in that way. It's just how they're applied to different structures is different, whether it's contributing, non-contributing, et cetera. Um, and about the porches, we do have guidelines that reference specifically porches, um, but they're not so prescriptive to a size because one historic district might have like Curtis Park, you know, has a lot of porches, um, but it's our guidelines are written more to make sure that they're similar to others in the district. So if you go to a different district, it's not maybe those porches aren't the same size. Um, or maybe if you go from one block to another, the size varies. So it's more about fitting the district patterns and the adjacent properties or similar structures than than saying a specific dimension. And I'll let Jen, if you want to weigh in on that. But yeah, that's, that's, a, that's absolutely true. And um, we also, just to add one bit to it, some buildings historically had really small porches with a little stoop and some buildings had a wide um, full width porch. Uh, and so we look at those as well to evaluate whether porches, um, whether a full width porch is appropriate, whether a partial width or half width, all of that. Um, but we do, we have guidelines about porches for um, an existing historic house for um, infill buildings as well. So there's, there are, porches are throughout the, um, the guidelines. And it is something that we'll, we'll be addressing in each section. So when we address the alterations to historic buildings section, we will address porches then. And when we talk about, um, porches uh, in for infill for that phase. We will talk about it then. Thank you very much. And I just want to tell you, you guys are doing a great job. This is a, a, a great forum. I really i am glad I, I participated. Thank you. Thank you. So we have a few questions related to landscaping um, and what our purview is there. Uh, and if the guidelines will become more strict or flexible and if it is appropriate to re regulate temporary or um, elements that do not permanently alter the property, and then if retaining walls um, are on our radar and the change of the Denver Hill. Abby, do you want that one? Do you want me to take it? Sure, I can take it. Um, so yeah, we're definitely looking at trying to have some more flexibility, that's one of the things that we really want to hear from you. Like, how important do you feel retaining walls are to the character of the district? Um, and I know I noticed there's a question in the chat, somebody concerned about um, the disappearance of the Denver Hill. And so that's one of the things we're trying to balance, like how important is it to the district character to maintain things like historic slopes? How much should we allow flexibility for things like retaining walls? What materials are appropriate for retaining walls? Um, so those are definitely some items that are up for debate that we really want to get feedback on. Uh, we currently only review permanent 
site changes. So we review sidewalks, retaining walls, fences, you know, changes to the slope, but we don't require any temporary, you know, we don't review things that are temporary. Um, so, you know, putting something up that isn't, you know, if you're gonna set a planner on the ground that's not permanently affixed or something, you know, we don't review, um, you know, any plantings and we don't review things that are temporary that are not permanently affixed. And we definitely do allow a lot more flexibility for the rear. Um, so if you want to put in, you know, a big patio and a swimming pool and a barbecue pit and a fire pit, as long as those are all in the backyard, that's probably just fine. They still need to come through us for review, but do, you know, we're, we're mainly concerned about how, you know, the relationship of the, this, you know, maintaining the historic streetscape and that relationship of the, you know, front of the property. So there is a question about um, it be it may be more expensive to maintain properties that are landmarked, and if that is true, and what our office is doing to make living in a historic district more affordable, um, given our guidelines and the review cost. I'm happy to take part of that one thing that we do is that by living in a historic district you are eligible for historic preservation tax credits so just wanted to mention that in case anyone is not familiar with that program that all maintenance of historic materials so things like maintaining your brick doing repointing doing foundation work repairing your roof you know any kind of repair to the exterior material, as well as doing system upgrades. So things like needing a new furnace, needing, you know, new electrical, installing HVAC, like that all would be qualifying for the historic preservation tax credit. So that is one way that living in a historic district makes it more, you know, because you can kind of, you know, help with the cost of maintaining a historic building. Um, Otherwise, just say we are working on trying to, like when our recent guidelines for La Alma Lincoln, we are trying to provide some more flexibility and considering some of those things with cost. I don't think it's necessarily more expensive, but sometimes it can be if you, you know, are, you know, sometimes it does cost more for some of the historic materials. Um, but that is why there is the tax credit program to help balance that cost. So you might have to pay more for, you know, historically, you know, appropriate roofing, but the tax credit will help you get some of that money back. So that program is really there to help, you know, balance out some of those costs. Um, also, just want to say that we don't require that any, you know, we, you, you know, can't let your property fall down, but we don't require that you make any changes. So we review, our reviews just kick in when you apply to do work. Um, you know, we're not going to, otherwise, you know, structures are designated as is. So we're not, you know, like, requiring that because you're now listed, you have to make certain changes. And I just want to make a plug for the tax credit program as well. It's a state tax credit and it's a it's 20% um, credit for, for your taxes from, of, of qualified expenses. So if you spend $10,000 to replace your roof, um, you can get 20% tax credit for that work, which is fantastic. So it offsets and you can use it for up to 10 years, depending on your tax liabilities. Um, there's also, um, if you, if you, have hail damage and you have an insurance claim, you can still take claim a tax credit on that, which is kind of cool. Um, they, during a disaster declaration period, that tax credit goes up to 25%, excuse me, 25%. And um, due to the statewide COVID declaration, um, disaster declaration last year, then we are in that 25% um, period up until I think it's 2025, might be, might be 26, I can't remember exactly, but it's on our website or, will be updated on our website soon. Um, feel free to email us if you have questions about tax credit. We're always happy to, to help out with that one. Jen, it looks like we have a hand raised from Sue Glassmacher. Sue, feel free to unmute yourself at any time. Hi, I just, I, the guidelines are very dense and very informative and I can't see any way around that. I just want to clarify who are these, who is the targeted user of these guidelines? I always think it's staff and the commissioners. I haven't seen a lot of architects use them. Great question, Sue. Um, so 
the, the target is many people. So the, our, we use them as staff um, to make sure that the project, as I said, if it doesn't meet the design guidelines, we have to bring it to the commission. Um, the Landmark Preservation Commissioners use those in their evaluation of projects as well. But really, they're meant to be used by architects and property owners so that they have um, understanding and certainty as to what is um, what what guidelines apply to their project. So if they are proposing to do an addition, they should be looking at the addition chapter. If they are proposing to do infill, they should be looking at that. Um, we we have them on our website. So. Um, fairly prominently so that people can take a look at those. We are doing a big update to our, design, our uh, website in the coming month. And so hopefully it will be even easier to use in the next few weeks. And also RNOs use them as well, <laughs> for sure. Any other other questions? So there is a um, clarification question that the current guide, design guideline update will not affect the custom design guidelines for ones like La Alma Lincoln Park and other custom design guidelines. Yes, that is correct. So those actually were just um, approved, um, adopted today um, because they were signed by uh, our chair of our LPC Kelly and also by the city attorney's office. So those went into effect today, which is fantastic. Um, we will put some pictures in there, but the, the content is, are not, is not going to be changed um, for that. We're not making changes through this design guideline update for the main set of design guidelines for um, any of the other customized design guidelines that are associated with specific historic districts. Um, so there's some questions about additions in the chat. Um, and I will start with the 15 foot setback was new in 2014. And before that, there was more flexibility around how to set back or place an addition. Do you find that being so prescriptive that it has been helpful or more challenging? A good one. Um, so uh, I did notice that in the, the Q&A, there was also a question about whether there would be any flexibility about maybe the rear two thirds instead of the, the front third, things like that. I think these are all things that are great for us to have conversations about as we do the, um, the addition design guideline update. Because, um, because we have heard from the community that they don't love the 15 feet and some people love it, some people don't. Um, and let's talk about it. Let's, let's have that conversation and make sure that um, there, there's consistency to how we, um, how we approach it. There's also a question about prohibiting um, addition, second story additions on 1950s homes. Um, perhaps Abby wants to answer that as we don't have many 1950s districts. <laughs> sure. So that question seems to be, you know, more like, could we, you know, how could you restrict height for a whole, um, you know, kind of neighborhood that's single story? And that really gets into one of our other tools, which isn't district um, doing historic district designation, but that's the type of thing that can be dealt with really well through an overlay. And so we do have several overlays that relate to our historic districts that kind of work in conjunction. Um, but we also have things like the overlay that was done for the Crisana Park neighborhood, which would be an example of using a zoning overlay to maintain height. And the overlay is something that works, the conservation overlay works really well if you have um, a neighborhood that all has really similar characteristics. So if your houses are all the same height, have the whole same roof form, you know, similarly, it works really well. And, you know, Crisana Park um, put in an overlay that does restrict the height. Um, so that was done specifically to keep that, you know, kind of single story character. And conservation overlays come from the neighborhood are proposed and they can also work in conjunction with historic districts as well. Um, so Curtis Park has an overlay, Potter Highlands. And so sometimes if there's a unique characteristic of your neighborhood that you really want to preserve through zoning, um, that is an additional tool. I 
I saw just a, I, I just um, responded to Steve Harley, who said that he started a next door group um, for the design guideline update, which is fantastic. What a great idea. So thank you, Steve, for doing that. Greatly appreciated and um, hope that you guys can all participate in that and um, uh, share it with your neighbors on next door for sure. Um, so there's not too many questions left in the chat. Um, there is some questions about uh, when these guidelines will be adopted. So is it still timeline questions? Um, and then we do have some comments from West Highlands about uh, what they would like to see included in the design guidelines that include uh, public notice uh, should be posted for zone lot splits and new infill on vacant lots, um, solar access, uh, and sunlight should be considered as part of character defining features. Um, and the assessor's office should include landmark status on the landing page, uh, but it's buried. And then um, a standard process for enforcement and that the Landmark Preservation Commission should be the final vote on designations. Those are great comments. I'm going to, I'm, I'll just address a couple of them real fast. Um, that, uh, so our public notification um, for design review and lot splits in fill construction, things like that, um, are part of our uh, rules and regulations that are adopted for design review. Um, we also have our registered neighborhood organization referral process in there. We are planning to make some minor updates to that process because um, there's some dates in there that are wrong and things like that. Um, you can, you got the RNOs uh, have to sign up but with the city by a certain date, but then we can't ask you all if you want to do design review before that date because you haven't signed up yet, but yet our dates are wrong, you know, silly things like that. So we got to fix that. Um, but we, we also will, um, we need to address um, signage and, and public notification when there are large scale projects. So that's something that we want to tackle um, early next year. We hope to get into that. That's not part of the design guidelines. It's um, entirely part of the rules and regulations for design review. So it's a different process, but, um, but we will make it a public process as well. Um, the uh, assessor's office totally agree with that, that we, we want to have landmark status on their, um, on their main page when you do a property search um, and it's something that's been on our to-do list for a while and we will get to it. Um, the uh, enforcement process, we have a landmark inspector who does enforcement and many of you I know have uh, worked previously with, with Delfino and then with Andy. Um, we are going to be recruiting for a new landmark inspector because Andy is now a forestry inspector. So you may see her out and about um, as well, but we're, um, we do have a, a landmark process for enforcement um, and we're, we're trying to make sure that it's, it's consistent and regular. Um, and then the Landmark Preservation Commission to be the final vote on, um, on uh, landmark status on a designation. It's not something that city council, I think, would ever uh, allow us to, um, to do. It's in many other cities, there are um, it, city council or the mayor's office are actually the ones who make that decision um, and not the Landmark Preservation Commission. In other cities, it's the Landmark Preservation Commission. So. Um, but the, the political mood here is that we, we have it through the um, city council and um, there's not, that would be a, a total ordinance update. And um, I don't think there would be any political support for taking that away from city council by city council. <laughs> so. um, our last question is if we will be participating in the zoning process um, that is currently proposed for the ADU rezoning. Um, that is going on citywide? Great question. So that um, landmark preservations is uh, within planning services in community planning and development. So there's planning services, there's development services, which is the building department and zoning department and inspections. Um, and we are with planning services. Planning services is the one who's doing the design, the um, ADU um, rezoning project. And so, yes, that's something that we plan to be involved with and, and um, interact with them on because they are our colleagues who sit very close to us and, and we will be um, as engaged as we possibly can on that. 
it's important to us. So there was a question earlier about what, what we do to allow greater density in our history, in our city um, as a as a climate goal, but also as an affordability goal that's really important to us as well. And one of the ways that we do that is um, accessory dwelling units in many of our historic districts are allowed. And it takes the development pressure off of the historic building and puts it into um, a granny flat or an ADU in the backyard um, and allows greater density in our, our urban neighborhoods, which is fantastic. We have a question about the permitting process. Um, so does the permitting office check if properties are in historic district before issuing permits? And what did we do for projects that have been completed but are in violation? And the owner says that they got a permit but weren't told their home was in a historic district. Great question. So we have our permitting system is called the CELA. It is, um, it's a software that has all sorts of bells and whistles to it and it's incredibly complicated. But the one of the great things about it is that when someone types in an address um, and uh, say that they type in um, the city and county buildings address, that's in the, his, in the Civic Center Historic District. And so that flags a little bar at the top that says, this is in a historic district and um, therefore landmark review is required. And it gets, and so the staff person will, flag, as soon as they see that they will, um, flag us for review on that. Occasionally people enter addresses incorrectly. They might put South instead of North or something like that. And um, we aren't flagged. Some uh, More often what happens is that we're flagged for properties that are adjacent to a historic district. So um, if you are right across the street from a historic district or right across an alley, sometimes we get flagged for those and we try to clear those out as soon as we can. But those are false negatives or false positives. Um, we, we, do sometimes have properties that do not get flagged as a landmark or in a historic district. And so um, when we figure, when we find out that that's happened, we work with our inspections department to, um, to not allow that permit to be, have been issued to rescind it or to um, require landmark review and revision of that permit once it happens. It's pretty rare, but it does happen. Any other questions? Um, not seeing too many questions in the chat anymore. Um, I don't know if there are any hand raises. There are no hand raises currently. Uh, there, there is a follow up to the permit uh, and violation question. Um, so homeowners would have to retrofit the completed work. Yeah, and I, I will say that almost it's almost always something fairly minor. You might have someone who, um, uh, it would, it, it's almost never something big like building a garage or building an addition or something like that. It's usually some, um, some minor work that uh, slipped through somehow um, uh, with the building department. And in that case, we have required people to retrofit or we bring it to the Landmark Preservation Commission and, um, and have them evaluate whether it should comply with the guidelines or whether it should be, um, there should be greater flexibility. It's really on a case by case basis. And again, it's very rare that it happens. Kelly? A, a common one we see is window replacements because yeah. if you're replacing your windows in their current locations, you don't need a building permit, but you do if you're in a historic district. And so people don't always know that or have a contractor who doesn't know that. And uh, so they don't get the proper permit. And then uh, maybe a neighbor reports them later or something. And, uh, and then they come in and, you know, say they put all vinyl windows in and we've, we've had to say, yeah, that doesn't meet the guidelines and they have yeah. to pull out their brand new windows and replace them. It's, it's really hard. It's sad, but um, it does happen. Yeah. And again, that's pretty rare. The, um, what happens more often um, is not that people didn't get, didn't, not that people got a permit, but that they were told they didn't need a permit. And that is really common. I mean, how many, I, I own a home and how many times has my contractor told me, I don't actually need a permit for this. And I work in the building department, so I know. <laughs> I know that it requires a building permit um, or zoning permit. And, but the average homeowner doesn't know that. And so um, we are aware that that happens, um, that people don't 
always recognize that that happens. And it's not to say that contractors are misleading people. Sometimes they just don't know. Anything else? So I think uh, uh, she had a follow-up that said solar, solar panels. panels placed in the wrong areas. Yeah, so we've had we had a project that came to the commission that, where the solar panels were in the front third, and the commission um, said that they didn't think that it was an appropriate um, appropriate for that historic context and required them to be moved. There were there was some flexibility as to where those could be moved um, to to be rearranged a little bit, but um, it's always a case by case basis. Well, thank you all for participating in the meeting. I know it's a, a long one and it's during dinner and um, everyone has been really attentive. So thank you for um, thank you for joining us. We're really grateful for all of the wonderful questions and the mentee feedback. Um, the if you go to denvergov.org slash landmark, um, you will see the information about the design guidelines are right up there on the front of the homepage. And there's a link there you can click to have access to our, um, our survey and we'll keep updating it as we go along. So um, we will keep, we have most of many of your email addresses and we will keep you all in the loop as we um, with targeted emails for the next phase for phase one kickoff. Um, but please definitely sign up for the Landmark newsletter to stay abreast of it as well and tell your neighbors and friends and colleagues and um, people who work in historic districts own hist properties in historic districts, individual landmarks um, and are fans of historic preservation as well. Great. Thank you and have a great night. Thanks.